The Biologic Association does not endorse expressly or by implication the corporate sponsor or its goods or services. So tonight we're going to be talking about, you know, why stage treatment for cartilage pathology. Next slide. So as we all know, cellular matrix and chondrocytes consisting of different zones as it transitions to the tide mark and attaches to an underlying bone. Due to its avascular nature, articular cartilage has low metabolic and poor regenerative capacity. Chondrocytes undergo a number of changes following an injury, which leads to degradation of its structure and progressive loss, ultimately resulting in symptoms such as pain, mechanical symptoms, recurrent effusions, and impaired function. Next slide, please. So the incidence of cartilage lesions is fairly high. Focal chondral defects occur in up to 75% of patients undergoing knee arthroscopy, and 50% of athletes undergoing A-cell reconstruction have a concomitant cartilage defect. And if left untreated, these patients are unable to progress, have difficulty with their activities of daily living, and also can limit their sports participation. Next slide. So there's several flavors to the way that these may present uh, acute. This is typically in my practice, more of a patellofemoral issue. A lot of times with patellar dislocations, these patients present with an acute traumatic injury to the knee, significant effusions, and oftentimes will have mechanical symptoms and locking uh, from loose bodies and, and things such as that. Uh, the silent and chronic in my practice is more a presentation of the weight-bearing femoral condyles. Um, these typically present with recurrent effusions, pain with increased activity, deep achy pain, either on the medial lateral side, as well as some weakness and some mechanical symptoms. But for me, the most specific and sensitive findings for a cartilage problem that is symptomatic and worth looking into uh, oftentimes result in recurrent effusions as well as significant mechanical symptoms. Next slide. So factors to consider when we're discussing the first stage or the arthroscopic inventory. For me, it's all about the lesion characteristics. The most important factor I think in this is location, location, location. So for me in the patellofemoral joint, I often do consider most of the time a cell-based therapy like Macy. Um, you know, during the inventory, we're also looking at the size, the depth, Subchondral bone is assessed on the MRI, but you could also, during the arthroscopy, look for intralesional osteophytes or other deformation of the subchondral plate, which may kind of change your thought or change your plan. Uh, meniscus status is very easily visualized. Oftentimes, when people come to me, they've had one, two, three, four surgeries, and you're not quite sure how much meniscal tissue is left, what kind of protection they have in that regard. So the arthroscopy is very beneficial. Uh, ligamentous stability. I've only been fooled in this a couple of times, but it has happened where we go in for an arthroscopy and patient has a high grade tear of the ACL in between the time they got their MRI and we took them in for their uh, first stage. So the, the identification of any ligamentous instability and direct visualization of the ACL and PCL can be very helpful. Um, but overall, you know, we're just looking at the overall health of the knee, focal defects versus more of a diffuse if it's progressed since the time that they had their initial MRI or any other factors which make, make you lean one way or the other. Next slide. So really for me, when we talk about assessing factors inside the knee, it all kind of boils down to location. And particularly what I'm more interested in is the degree of undermining or delamination of the articular surface, particularly posterior. I feel like when I take people in for the first stage, a lot of times any sort of delaminated flap of cartilage they have extending towards the posterior femoral condyle, on the medial or lateral side will often lead to a bigger discussion because it will change my plan in terms of degree of exposure if you have to take down other structures in order to get to that lesion, uh, making it a bigger surgery. Um, again, meniscal status, easily identified and planned for once you directly visualize it, uh, maybe even a repair is indicated. And then ligaments, you know, planning a ligament reconstruction at the same time as you may see implantation is something that needs to be planned beforehand and getting a direct visualization of this, I think is very helpful. Next slide. Assessing factors outside of the knee. In terms of the way that it's gone for me over the last few years of doing some autologous chondrocyte implantation, one and two are more of a finesse type issue. So a lot of people come in, they want to have the surgery for uh, 
you know, it's all just chondrocyte implantation, but, you know, FDA approved from 18 to 55, you can have that discussion with them and discuss that maybe this is just not the right option for them. In terms of weight, I do work in Western Pennsylvania, so this is often a factor for us. Uh, you know, a lot of times we will discuss that the debridement and the simple first stage of the arthroscopy can help with their pain and symptoms, and we can hold on to the biopsy for five years and allow them to, you know, maybe lose some weight. In terms of the profession and expectations when it comes to planning for the second stage, you know, fitting this into someone's life, not often do people have nine to 12 months to fully limit their activity. A lot of my patients come in with acute traumatic injuries that are manual laborers, work in the mines, work, you know, on the railroad or out in the oil fields. So trying to figure out not only their ability to take off work and allow for an appropriate time to heal, but also managing their expectations is a, is a long discussion. Next slide. So articular cartilage defects, as we mentioned before, very common. 60% uh, of these arthroscopies will be found to have a cartilage defect. And surprisingly, 6 to 7% of these will be greater than two centimeters, which oftentimes will be symptomatic and will need to be addressed. Next slide. So when we evaluate these patients in the office, what I'm really trying to key in on is if the cartilage lesion that we see on the MRI or any sort of imaging that's done prior to them coming to me is actually correlating to their symptoms. So, you know, the, the direct correlation and making sense of their symptoms in light of what we see on the MRI is something that's really important when they come to see me in the office. Assessing any other injuries, ligamentous instability, coronal plane alignment, or other factors that we need to address are also very much needed to be discussed and proper imaging ordered prior to, you know, them undergoing the second stage. The measurement size by MRI is often underappreciated. I think, you know, for us, we only have a 1.5 Tesla magnet. It's often very difficult to fully assess the full size of the lesion. And I am often, I would say almost every time we take them in for their diagnostic arthroscopy or exploratory arthroscopy, the lesion is much bigger than, than what it shows on the MRI. So once we gather all of this information, weighing the needs and expectations, trying to fit that into the patient's life, trying to really set the patient's expectations for the second surgery and their recovery, I think is something that can be difficult to do, but is very necessary in order to make sure you are selecting the appropriate patients for the procedure. Next slide. So as we talked about before, and especially in my practice, I mean, the MRI definitely does not accurately determine the defect size. Next slide. And luckily, Dr. Flanagan at The Ohio State University has done a lot of work looking at this type of thing. So when they looked at preoperative MRI versus what they saw in the arthroscopy, MRI underestimated the cartilage defect area by an average of one centimeter squared, which in a small female, this could be a significant amount of surface area in her knee. Next slide. The practical benefits, I think, of MRI are really in assessing any sort of extra articular ligaments that may be present, as well as the degree of subchondral edema, subchondral cystic change. But I think that unequivocally, the diagnostic arthroscopy is very important. And I would say a lot of times my, either, my plan after the arthroscopy is either tweaked a little bit or maybe changed a significant amount based on what we find when we're directly visualizing the cartilage defect. And a lot of times what that means is that the defect extending very far posterior, or if the defect's extending over into the notch, maybe there's a big delaminated flap of cartilage extending from the medial from a condyle up into the medial trochlea, you know, your plan's going to be different based on what you find there. So it is very, very useful in terms of, of planning for your big procedure. The other question I often get asked the most from patients is, does time matter? They always want to know, well, if I have my MRI, but I wait to do the arthroscopy, or if I have the arthroscopy and I wait to do the implantation, what are the consequences? Next slide. And what we can tell them is that these delays in surgery and delay to implantation actually does increase the size of lesion. So what Dr. Flanagan and his team found was that on average, lesion size increases about 10 millimeters squared per month. And that's not insignificant. When you look at the total surface area of some of these defects, 
people wait six, eight months and it can be rather significant. And the other thing to also consider are the presentation of new lesions. And what they found was that the prevalence of new lesions at implantation was about 16.2%, which is not insignificant considering that if you have a very large lesion to start with, you may need some extra graft in order to make both work. Next slide. So I believe one of our other presenters will touch on the in-office arthroscopy, but I do believe this has provided us some good data and that a lot of times with the in-office arthroscopy and merely just taking a look, you know, there's often a change in treatment plan and especially in the patellofemoral cases. So I do believe that this technology is forthcoming and it will probably be very useful and it's the best way to make a plan for a patient. Go ahead, next slide. And that kind of tailors into this final slide, you know, whether it's a femoral condyle defect, a weight-bearing condyle defect, a tough femoral joint chondral defect. Oftentimes, once you've done a diagnostic arthroscopy, you can fully assess where the location of the lesion is, how far it extends, maybe medial or laterally, uh, any other meniscal issue, ligamentous issue. It really allows you to fully kind of quantify everything that needs to be addressed in order to normalize the environment and really come up with a good plan. And I do think patients appreciate this. I do feel as though the arthroscopic images kind of set the stage for them. They understand the significance of, of the procedure they're about to undergo in order to fix this problem. And they really understand the individualized approach that each of these take for the patient. Next slide. The treatment for cartilage lesions in terms of most acute chondral lesions with a loose body will be treated, you know, rather acutely and patients typically tend to understand the significance of this from the get go. You know, they had an injury, their knee swelled up, their knee locked up on them. It's not too difficult to talk to these people, get them on board with an arthroscopy to, you know, remove these loose bodies, identify where these defects are, talk about ways that we can reconstruct their knee in a helpful manner to get them back what they want to do. In. In terms of the chronic cartilage lesions, these ones can be a little bit more tricky. Oftentimes, at least in my practice, people have a difficult time understanding why they didn't have more symptoms prior to this lesion getting big enough to where they feel as though it needs to be treated. And so a discussion with them about the avascularity and the aneural nature of, car of cartilage is very helpful. What I will say is that oftentimes when they're referred in from their PCP, they will often have this misnomer about how some small meniscal tear is actually the problem and not this big glaring focal defect on their weight bearing surface of their condo. And that's oftentimes a long discussion in trying to backtrack them and try and get them focused on what's important. Um, ruling out other sources of pain is something that should be done from the get-go. And oftentimes the hardest thing to do is correlate their physical exam findings and their history to what you're seeing on the MRI. Um, often for me, a trial of conservative measures is really based on a bit individualized approach, you know, for, for younger patients with large defects, I'm not much in favor of a, a trial of conservative measures, but that's kind of to each uh, surgeon's discretion. Next slide. So in the end, I think this kind of boils down to what's important, you know, MRI, I would say almost certainly underestimates the size of these defects. Almost every time I get in there, there's, you know, a lot of the native surrounding cartilage is undermined, not very functional, and the defects are much bigger than they appeared on the preoperative imaging. Arthroscopy allows you to directly visualize this, will definitely help in terms of clarity and forming a more appropriate individualized plan for these patients. Um, and then you can talk to them, you can tell them that you know they may improve for a bit. If this doesn't necessarily fit into their life for the next six months, they wanna wait till the winter time to have the surgery, chondroplasty, loose body removal, and biopsy is probably the way to go because this will help alleviate some of their symptoms and, and, and make them possibly a little bit more functional. In terms of assessing the environment, the direct visualization of the meniscus, I think, is very useful um, by means of arthroscopy, especially um, in patients with previous surgery, and also visualizing the cruciates to make sure that there's no reconstruction that needs to be performed at the same time is kind of very, you know, undoubtedly useful. Um, the patient psychology, I think the arthroscopic images are very useful to kind of set the stage for patients to help them understand what's going on because no matter how many 
pictures or models I often show people. I feel as though a direct picture and an arthroscopic image of their knee really helps kind of set the stage and really helps people understand what's going on. Um, insurance approval, we can talk about that later. And really assessing whether this patient can undergo the rehab and has the resilience needed for the larger surgery is very important. So Dr. Mosher, I thought that was a fantastic start to the session. Um, I did have a question. I thought you did a really great job of uh, demonstrating the fact that there's increasing data that the delay to definitive treatment leads to progression of disease or worsening pathology. I'm curious in your practice or Dr. Cotton's practice, is there a delta in the time where you'll say to the patient, you know what, you need a new MRI or would even consider another diagnostic arthroscopy before transitioning or like proceeding with the definitive Macy? I think for me, a lot of it has to do with what they report to me. So if the patient complains of significant worsening pain, mechanical symptoms, or effusions, I would hold back from getting another imaging study. Um, if there's a significant change in their status, meaning if their knee suddenly locks up on them, um, you know, another injury skiing. I just had this situation where I had a kid who we did an MRI, we did a diagnostic arthroscopy, took a biopsy, but then he went skiing, had another big injury. So I did scope him again and he had a high grade partial tear of his ACL. So for me, without any new injury or really big significant change in symptoms, I would say one year. For, one year. For and Dr. Cotton, anything different? No, I would agree. Um, if a uh, individualized approach. So if there's something that kind of sets my spidey sense off, then I might want to get a new MRI or another diagnostic arthroscopy. And I'm really about at that one year um, because I know how the lesions can progress. So I, I think I would say the same answer. Gotcha. It's the same for me. It's, a, you know, if they come back, if they, you know, they're doing fairly well after their debridement and it's a year later. Yeah. That's when I'm going to say, all right, listen, we got to regroup, get current data before we make this big decision. All right, so it's it's I'm, it's my turn. I'm up, and we're going to talk about kind of uh, my approach to knee evaluation. Um, basically, my approach to the arthroscopy and the, the obtaining of the cartilage biopsy for Macy. So when you're thinking about cartilage restoration or joint preservation, I think it's really important that you acknowledge that it's really a journey and a team sport, and you got you need to get everyone that's involved on the same page. You got to get the, the, the patients with you, your assistants in the office, the physical therapist that you're going to work with to really get a good feel of what that patient's goals and expectations are, set the understanding and expectations for the milestones, and really kind of optimize the ability to achieve the outcome you're all looking for. Next slide. Uh, as Dr. Mosier mentioned, there's been a lot of epidemiologic studies basically just showing the, the, the prevalence of cartilage disease. There have been a number of large uh, studies looking at consecutive knee arthroscopies that show an incidence of chondral defects ranging from 60 to 66%, irrespective of the surgical indication. Uh, next slide. Um, pretty much every cartilage talk I've ever given has uh, a reference to this CURL study, where they looked at 30, almost 32,000 consecutive knee arthroscopic cases and noted a 63% incidence of cartilage injury. And they, their data demonstrated that 5% of the cohort were patients younger than 40 with a full thickness chondral defect. And you may say to yourself, well, 5% is a pretty low incidence. But if you think of 5% of 32,000, that's 1,600 young active patients with a chondral lesion that you know is not going to heal on its own and has the propensity to increase in size and cause uh, future problems. Next slide. And why is it significant? Because when you have a defect like this, you're going to get an altered distribution of weight-bearing forces. You get concentration of the stresses at the defect rim and on the opposing articular surface. This causes decreased contact areas, edge loading, and increased peak stresses, starting a cascade of events that lead to degenerative changes, including chondrocyte apoptosis, the breakdown of extracellular matrix, and the influx of uh, pro-inflammatory and cartilage breakdown enzymes into the joint space. Next slide. And everyone always says, well, how big is too big? There have been a number of biomechanical studies, including this Gutler study from AJSM, that basically demonstrated that a defect greater than a centimeter in diameter is going to have a significant impact on the ability of the cartilage to distribute normal weight-bearing forces. Next slide, please. 
So Dr. Mosher showed the classic three-legged stool when you're thinking about cartilage restoration and joint preservation. I like this Venn diagram. And it's the idea of you really have to pay attention to all the potential comorbidities that are could be present that you have to identify and address to ensure a durable and effective cartilage restoration. Every single patient that I'm considering cartilage surgery here at NYU is going to get a set of long leg alignment films because I want to make sure that we're going to optimize the environment and have a very low threshold for a concomitant osteotomy. So we're all focused, you know, the, the chip shots are the ones down here in the bottom of the green circle where it's a focal isolated lesion in a normally aligned knee with stable ligaments. Things get definitely more interesting, more complex, and to be honest with you, more fun when you get to the intersection where you're taking care of patients that need additional, uh, basically, concomitant procedures. Next slide. So when you're thinking about the treatment options for cartilage defects, you know, what we're here to focus on tonight is really the restorative procedures. Autologous chondrocyte implantation, you can think about osteochondral autographs, osteochondral allografts, and then particulated juvenile articular cartilage. For me here at NYU, my two go-tos, my workhorses are Macy and osteochondral allografts. Next slide. And I really think it's important to understand like the algorithm. And we're all going to have our own approach. For me, it's really based on the patient's age, their activity level, and then really what's going on with respect to the underlying bone. For me, if it's a, if it's a large uh, osteochondral lesion with cystic change, that's going to be an osteochondral approach. If it's a surface lesion with an intact and preserved subchondral bone plate, I think that is a, a perfect case for a cell-based repair like Macy. Next slide. So if you're thinking about, well, take a step back. What is Macy? So Macy is, is characterized autologous chondrocytes on a resorbable porcine type 1-3 collagen membrane. And these cells are, con are, are seated on that membrane at, an, at a very large co a concentration of a half a million to a million cells per square centimeter. And the beauty of this approach is that you can customize the implant to be an exact fit for the size and shape of the treated defect. The key steps are what we're going to talk about now is basically the defect assessment and the biopsy collection. That biopsy is going to end up with the varicell folks who are going to propagate the chondrocytes and seed the membrane. And then in a future session, they'll talk about the second stage, which is the Macy implantation. And compared to the earlier iterations of uh, autologous chondrocyte implantation, Macy is definitely a step forward. It's a faster procedure with smaller incisions. Uh, anecdotally, I've seen in my patients that compared to the older version, because it's a more efficient procedure that can be done through a smaller approach, there's less post-operative pain and swelling. You can treat defects in areas where ACI would have been difficult to effectively sew in. We don't have to worry about creating a watertight seal, not concerned about leakage. And one of the most important factors here is the accelerated rehabilitation protocol, basically pushed forward by our colleagues down in Australia. There's now a much smaller delta between the rehab for ACI, for Macy compared to some of the other cartilage repair techniques out there, which makes it an easier sell in the office. Next slide, please. So when you're thinking, well, what patients are good candidates? It's those 18 to 55 years of age who have a moderate to large symptomatic full thickness defect in the knee, that they have real, realistic expectations, they have a good support network and are able to perform the rehab protocol. As we mentioned before, uh, Macy's indicated for defects with a surface area of greater than two square centimeters. You can treat with cells alone for an osteochondral lesion that has less than six millimeter, millimeters of involvement of the underlying bone. For anything more than that, you will be performing what's called a sandwich technique, where you utilize autologous bone grafting and then two Macy implants, one with the cell side facing up and the other one with the cell side facing down. Next slide, please. So the fast facts on Macy, as we mentioned, it's a simplified version of cell-based cartilage repair that can be done through a mini arthrotomy. You're sealing it with fibrin sealant alone. So it's much fewer steps. You're not sewing in the patch. You're not gluing around the periphery. You're not creating that watertight seal like you used to. There's been over 17 years of clinical experience uh, outside the U.S. Um, following uh, Dan Saris's phase three summit clinical, uh, clinical trial, the FDA approved Macy for uh, symptomatic lesions of the knee. And the results of Macy have been reported in almost 50 publications, including five randomized controlled trials. Next slide, please. As I mentioned before, it's a simpler, less invasive autologous chondrocyte implantation procedure. It's 
really a significant reduction in surgical time. And I really, like I mentioned, the accelerator rehab protocol makes it a much easier sell to your patients in the office. Next slide, please. The biggest and most recent uh, evolution was the development of this surgical implantation kit that includes uh, these templates, these cutting guides that allow you to be reproducible and extremely efficient when treating a chondral lesion with Macy. Next slide, please. So what we're going to talk about from here, the last few slides, is just my approach to the intraarticular knee evaluation and obtaining the cartilage biopsy for the second stage Macy procedure. Next slide. So we're going to start off with the diagnostic arthroscopy. And as Dr. Mosier mentioned, you're really trying to gather as much data as you can with respect to lesion-specific factors. Where is it? How big is it? Is it focal or multifocal? How deep is it? Does it involve the underlying subchondral bone plate? Um, what's its geometry? And importantly, is it contained or not contained? Meaning, is it surrounded by healthy articular cartilage? Next slide. I like to, when I'm talking to the residents and fellows, I like to say you want to have a systematic approach to evaluate the entire joint. For me, it's essentially the same pictures in the same order every time. So we're going to get a good feel for every, every aspect of the articular surface throughout the knee. Look at the menisci, look at the ligaments. Next slide, please. So as we mentioned, you're going to examine the defect, you're going to debris. You want to get rid of any loose, unstable tissue. And as Dr. Mosier mentioned, I agree with him. Oftentimes, there's a delaminated flap, especially posteriorly. And you want to get a feel because the MRI is always going to underestimate the true size of the lesion that you're trying to treat. And as I mentioned, you really want to understand what's the status of the underlying bone. You'll get a good feel from the MRI, but you also can tell arthroscopically. And is it contained or not contained? You'll evaluate the dimensions. There's a lot of different ways to do this with respect to using the tip of the probe, which is typically four millimeters or some of the other measuring devices. It's important to note that in your assessment of that joint and the, the number and size of these cartilage lesions that you're intending on treating, if the size and the, the area of the defects that you're going to treat is greater than 10 square centimeters in total, you need to order two Macy implants uh, from Vericell to make sure you have adequate coverage. Next slide. With respect to obtaining the articular cartilage biopsy, there are three main non-weight-bearing areas of the knee that you can go after. There's a superior lateral trochlear ridge you see on the upper left, the superior medial trochlear ridge on the right, and then my preferred approach is the lateral intercondral or notch, essentially the area that you often will do uh, remove during a notch plasty for an ACL reconstruction. Next slide. I'm going to show you a little video in a second. You want to utilize either a notch plasty gouge, which is my preferred approach, or a sharp ring curette, you'll penetrate the cartilage just into the subchondral bone. You'll do a little wiggle maneuver, taking it from top to bottom or bottom to top to create a crescent-shaped specimen. You'll complete the harvest with an arthroscopic grasper, and you're looking for two to 300 milligrams of biopsy tissue. As you say, it's about two to three tic tac sized pieces of cartilage that you're then gonna ship off to Vericell. Next slide. So here's a video, please start it. So this is a notch plasty guide right in the, the lateral aspect of the intercondylar notch in front of the ACL. I'm getting through the cartilage just into the subchondral bone. And I'm going to basically raise my hand, wiggle down, and stay in that course. So we're not heading toward the articular cartilage or the weight-bearing portion. We're right along that intercondylar notch. We're going to take the biopsy in a single specimen that's adequate tissue. I like to leave it still attached at the bottom so then I can come in with the grasper gently grab it right at the junction. It's going to go right into a saline in a small specimen cup. And then we're going to hand, you know, we'll talk about handing it off into the uh, transport medium. Next slide. For completeness sake, this is also the other option. You can use a sharp ring curette. Same idea. You're going to penetrate the cartilage into the subchondral bone. Take that biopsy. I think this is a little more technique dependent and using the uh, notch plasty gouge. Um, but whatever you get good at, as long as you get adequate tissue and reliably uh, so, that's what you should go with. Next slide. Once that biopsy is taken, you want to make sure it gets into the transport medium. I basically will, I want that, I want that specimen in the transport medium before I scrub out of that case, before the portals are closed. If God forbid it ends up on the floor, I want the ability and the opportunity to get an additional specimen. 
It's important to note that the Bobsy tube exterior is not sterile. So the circulating nurse will hold the tube away from the sterile field. And either you as the surgeon or your scrub tech will carefully drop the specimen into the transport medium. You'll ensure that the cartilage biopsy transmittal notice is complete. You'll get a patient ID number, and you're going to make sure that the full name of the data biopsy is, is, is put in there, either by yourself or the circulating nurse. The labeling, documentation, and packaging will all be done. And I like to tell the patients that their specimens are on their way to Boston before they're even uh, out of the PACU. Next slide. Postoperatively, the patients are weight bearing as tolerated, but I really do stress initial ice and elevation because it's not uncommon for that knee to get pretty swollen um, because you're getting into a little bit of bone, there could be some bleeding. It's not uncommon to have to aspirate the knee at the first post-op visit. That's something that I'll let the patient know preoperatively, just so set reasonable expectations. I do put every patient to formal postoperative physical therapy. Even if they don't really need it, I think it's important for documentation purposes, such that you can essentially prove that they're still symptomatic and functionally limited despite that debridement to make it a little easier to get insurance approval. Once they're in the uh, in the office for that first post-operative visit, I 100% agree with Dr. Mosher, and I'm sure we're going to hear from Dr. Cotton. This is the opportunity to show that patient what you found inside their knee. We'll do a careful review of their arthroscopic images, highlighting the location, the size, the depth of that lesion, and then we'll really get into what their treatment options are, what's associated with the procedure, the rehabilitation protocol, is a concomitant procedure necessary, like an osteotomy, concomitant ligament reconstruction, or meniscus transplantation? And basically, you're going to once again form that team. You're going to form that team approach to give that patient all the information they need to make a good informed decision, set the stage for their second stage of Macy, and give them the best opportunity uh, for a successful outcome. All right. I'm going to talk about some of that team approach that Dr. Strauss has brought and has brought up as well as Dr. Mosier, but first we're gonna talk about a couple of what ifs. Next slide, please. So what if you see an incidental defect? Um, we've spent a lot of time in this presentation talking about how MRI underestimates um, the degree of the lesion. Well, a lot of times MRI doesn't see the lesion at all. Um, I'd say probably what I get surprised the most um, on an arthroscopy is that MRI doesn't really show much of a lesion at, at all or if any. And I get in and I'm staring up at a picture that shows a pretty large chondral lesion over the two centimeters squared. So always, as we've talked about in this prior, prior in this presentation, carefully assess the entire knee. I totally agree with Dr. Strauss's approach. Um, I must have been one of his residents at some point in time because I assess the knee the same way every time and take the same pictures, just as he suggested. Uh, the best chance of successful articular cartilage restoration is the first chance. Uh, be prepared for what you might find, and don't be surprised by a cartilage lesion that you never saw on, um, on MRI. Um, unless you are sure that you want to microfracture this lesion, it's probably not a good idea to do so because most of the really good chondral restoration procedures don't go hand in hand with microfracture. Um, as Dr. Uh, Moser and Strauss both also said before, uh, a light chondroplasty is needed to remove unstable flaps or any loose pieces. Uh, measure um, in the anterior posterior direction and medial lateral. That'll be on the form for Macy uh, and document with photos and uh, dictation and always consider a chondral biopsy. Next slide, please. The first thing that I do um, is what Dr. Strauss are already brought up. I alert my office staff as soon as I take a biopsy, whether we plan to do it or we didn't plan to do it. Everyone, it's a team approach and everyone's on the same page. I have two back office nurses, a PA, a nurse practitioner, and my surgery scheduler is a former athletic trainer. Everybody knows usually within the first hour after I've taken a biopsy because the patient will call in or who knows when they'll call in, they'll ask questions. I might not be there and everyone's on, on the same page. Um, and it's the soonest opportunity that I get, I discuss what I found with the patient. Sometimes it's in the recovery room with pictures if I think that they'll remember what I'm going to say. But if it's not with the patient, I'll discuss it with, the, with their approved family member. I'll show their arthroscopy pictures, I'll show the lesion, and I'll start discussing options and start the education process then. Next slide, please. 
set aside time for discussion. Um, these are pretty complex uh, procedures and complex ideas. And so there's some time for discussion because a lot of patients kind of have to wrap their head around what's about to take place. Um, rest may, may make this better, but use the symptoms uh, will reoccur with activity. And I really like Dr. Strauss's idea about formal physical therapy to help prove that the symptoms are going to recur with activity. As Dr. Moser already brought up, uh, I usually explain uh, that cartilage does not heal on its own and the lesion will likely progress over time if not treated. We've already talked about that MRI is not a 100% test. Um, and there are other options. There's chondroplasty, there's microfracture, there's, uh, osteo, uh, there's oats, and osteochondral allograft. Next slide, please. I really try to get the patient as much as I can to see the world through my eyes. Uh, I discuss uh, all of the indications for Macy and how I came to make my decision or my recommendation in their particular case. The other thing that I do is I really don't call the chondral biopsy a biopsy. I call it a sample because uh, most people hear the word biopsy and they think about cancer. Um, so I call it a sample. I've taken a sample of their cartilage that can get um, replicated and grown in a lab, and then we can use that later to put their own cells back in their own knee. The other thing that I'm pretty uh, adamant about with my patients is a no obligation and a low pressure situation. Um, I usually tell them if I've taken a biopsy and it's a surprise, I'm like this, this obligates you to nothing. Um, we've got five years to use it. Um, and I, we've left all bridges intact. No, no, no bridges are burned. Um, th there's no harm. I explain where the biopsy uh, or the sample places are and why that won't harm them. It can only help them in the future if needed. And I explain why those biopsy or those sample locations are where they are. And then I start to touch on what's going to lie ahead with weight bearing limitations and physical therapy. So there's no large surprises. Next slide, please. This is an ongoing discussion at the post-operative visit. And if there's another visit after that, if we're waiting on the biopsy to grow. And my informed consent begins at the moment that Macy is a possibility and is ongoing. Um, just like Dr. Moser mentioned, the patients love arthroscopy pictures. Um, I've kind of learned that patients, even though they might not know a lot of orthopedics, they understand what pictures mean, even with a little bit of explanation. So I show the pictures in the lesion, discuss the symptoms, the uh, disease progression. Um, and it is a big undertaking for the patient with weight-bearing issues. And Dr. Moser mentioned he's got a lot of almost heavy laborers in, 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 in his area, and, and I do as well in mine. And so I try not to leave too much time if I think the lesions are going to progress, but I also urge them to schedule it at a time that's a little more convenient for them, that it's not an emergency, that they can work it into their life. Um, I just always re remind the patient that they're in control, and this is a low-pressure situation, but I'm always educating on not only the benefit the risk and benefits of the surgery, but what are the risks if we don't do the surgery? Um, and then I usually visit or revisit the physical therapy and the weight bearing plan. Next slide, please. Basic insurance approval rates um, overall are around 89%. My cartilage care uh, is a wonderful tool. Um, if someone's new to doing Macy, um, it can be maybe intimidating to think of, well, what kind of insurance work is this going to require my staff to do? And the answer is it requires my staff actually less work than almost any other thing that I do. Next slide, please. And so along with my cartilage care, um, the steps are really pretty easy. The form that you see on the left is what gets filled out by my surgery scheduler, and she'll notate the size and location of the lesion if there's any other procedures that are going to happen at the same time at the net at the impl implantation of the macy we'll help choose uh, the insurance network to let my college care know and fax the enrollment form uh, next slide please uh, there's also a rehab app so that patients can 
keep up with their daily progress and have a couple of tips and tricks or things to expect moving forward. In summary, um, I know in a world where we live in where we think that, well, there's one, there's one thing that's key. And I would say in this case, as far as communicating with patients and going from biopsy to implantation, no one thing is key. All of the little stuff matters. And I was a little bit surprised in this presentation how well Dr. Mosier and Strauss actually mentioned this ahead of this, this, this part of the presentation. Uh, ongoing communication from surgeon and staff um, is key. And that's why Dr. Strauss brought up the fact that everybody's got to be on the same page, all of the people involved that the patient could interact with. And there's always ongoing education in the process of Macy and Conferral restoration with the patient and ongoing informed consent and a very no to low pressure situation. I think we've seen in the last several years what high pressure situations do to people. And I think most people, in my experience, will make a good decision for themselves as long as they don't feel pressured to do so. Uh, next slide, please. And are there any questions from either the faculty this presentation or from um, the viewers? Uh, Dr. Cotton, that was that was that was a great talk. Um, you you discussed a little bit about insurance uh, approval rates. And I love the idea. I'm also very fortunate that my Verisol rep is very, you know, in tune with all the different carriers and what their criteria are. Do you have any like recommendations, tips or tricks with respect to like your documentation or how you go about things to make that insurance approval process smooth, efficient, to really make sure you're, you know, you're not having to do five appeals, writing different appeal letters, you know, peer, unnecessary peer to peers. So like what any tips for your approach? That's a great question. And so I'm a I'm a kind of a small town private practice guy in Panama City in the panhandle of Florida. And uh, I'm kind of an insurance and kind of a numbers guru because I kind of have to be. I don't have a large staff to work on this stuff if, if I mess up. So I'm just very clear on um, I actually usually know my insurance rules pretty well. Uh, my Vericell rep will kind of back me up and she'll give me some reminders. Um, we'll even discuss the case ahead of time. Um, she's very reachable. If I'm in the OR and I get a, a surprise situation, which is fairly common, I can call or text her or have one of the OR staff do the same thing. And she can kind of remind me if I'm forgetting something. Um, and that, so I know usually what the rules are and what the buzzwords are. And I'll document those very clearly in my op report. Uh, Dr. Mosier, any from your perspective, any any tips or tricks? I mean, I think it's just clear documentation of the defect size. I think one of the more important things that if I forget to mention, I have to get dinged on is that they have healthy surrounding cartilage. So healthy native surrounding cartilage is something that, you know, is somewhat intuitive, but I think it's really important to note in your uh, documentation so that this kind of can pass through easily. Yeah, I think, you know, like a kind of a general principle, a general rule is most most carriers the the threshold uh, the threshold size is two point five square centimeters. So you know the fact that you know most times this you know the, the immediate surrounding tissue is you know involved, delaminated. Um, sixteen by sixteen is always a good number that I keep in mind. Just make sure that that lesion meets it. Um, and also, I will specifically in my note say, despite the fact that the MRI noted, you know, this, the radiologist noted a 10 by 12 millimeter lesion. In fact, it was 20 by 18 by 20 uh, with, you know, likely additional involvement with the surrounding tissue that looked delaminated. So I just want to make sure that they get, they have clear understanding of the size of that lesion. Because in the end, a lot of times it's not an orthopedic surgeon that's reviewing that case. They have a checklist in front of them and you want to make sure that you've hit every box. Yeah. I also like Dr. Cotton. I like your, uh, use of the word sample instead of biopsy. I know we talked before and you have a very high rate of proceeding with the next stage and, uh, and using the word sample instead of biopsy is a very interesting little tweak to the process. I actually had uh, three Macy patients that were prospective patients this week, like leading up to this talk. And I asked them that question, would you, if I called it a sample versus a biopsy, would that make a difference to you? And I know it's a small sample size, but three out of three said, absolutely. They like the word sample. So kind of <laughs> retrospectively looked at it. Great tip. I, I got a question for you guys. If, if you know there's going to be concomitant procedures, you knew, you knew before the initial scope that there, you were going to do a, 
patellar stabilization or uh, high tibial osteotomy, will you do that at the time of the biopsy and see how the patients do, or are you going to do it all, all in one joint preservation approach? I do everything at once. So, you know, whether it's a ligamentous reconstruction and osteotomy or whatever else it may be, I tend to do everything at once. I tend to do like ACL reconstruction first, as long as the lesion is easy to get to. If I think I'm going to have trouble getting to it or I have an access issue, I'll wait and do the ACL reconstruction at the same time. But if I think the lesion is small and I can get to it through a small approach, I'll go ahead and get them stabilized first because I don't know what they're, I don't know when they're going to want to do the, the ACL procedure. And I don't want to leave them unstable that long on the patellar stabilization. Um, if, you know, I haven't really done a lot of, uh, tubal tubercle osteotomies along with Macy as of yet, but as far as MPFL and extensor mechanism realignment or reefing or whatever you want to call it, um, to get to the patella, you got to kind of go through that area. So I usually wait. I usually wait and do it all at one time because I don't want to do all that stuff and then go through it and have to do it again. Yeah, I, I like to do everything at once as well. I, part of it is also is like when you're discussing with the patient, the, the, the you know, I was going to call it the biopsy part, but the sample part. Um, <laughs> It's a, you, you can, you, you kind of, you're se kind of selling that as the easy one. That's the quick look around. We're going to document what's going on, clean up the lesion and get your sample to them, to put them through two relatively large recoveries, I think is a much harder sell than the quick one followed by the big one. So I'm with you guys. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll, yeah. Unless an ACI, I agree with you. I want to stabilize that knee, but for the osteotomies, the patellar stabilizations, I'm doing it all at oh, once. Yeah. Yeah, so to Dr. Khan's point about the ACL reconstruction with a concomitant Macy procedure, um, what I typically do is I'll do, I'll make my midline incision, I'll do everything through that one incision, past the graft, but I don't secure it on the tibial side, because like he said, oftentimes, it's a, if it's a very posterior defect, you don't want to be cranking back on that graft while you're implanting the graft, so I'll wait to do the tibial portion and secure it on the tibial side until you know, we've done the Macy portion, straighten the knee back out, then crank down the tibial side and then call it a day. Nice. I think we have just a couple of minutes left. Is there any questions from the audience? We really appreciate, oh, looks like we got a question. Uh, it says, any tips to assessing the medial aspect of the far posterior lateral femoral condyle with respect to your incision, retractors, things like that for access? So po really posterior aspect of the lateral femoral condyle. Yeah, I mean, this is, I think, in terms of whether you're doing Macy osteochondrialograft or whatever else it may be, these are the ones I tell the fellows to not consider for their first ones when they first go into practice. I think they're the most difficult to access. Um, I don't know about you guys. I don't shy away from doing a quad snip uh, to get back there. You guys have any input? The, um, I've been able to, uh, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Strauss. No, no, you go, Dr. you go. I don't know that I've had, I've, I've had ones that are pretty tight to get back there, but I don't know that I've had one that's been so far posterior yet that I've had a, a, to really, really, really struggle. For me, um, I have had two cases where I basically, you know, on the medial side, you can pie crust the MCL and it opens wide up. That's no problem. Uh, on the lateral side, clearly, you know, what I've done is I've taken a little square of bone and taken the LCL down as like a unit and then fixed it back with a screw at the end. And then the, the joints wide open a little bit of chest pain throughout that whole procedure, but it definitely worked. Um, I like that a little better than a quad snip. Yeah. One of the things that I learned in fellowship from Dr. Minus, who was kind of the pioneers of this, he would do, he would not hesitate from doing it. Uh, tubal tubercle osteotomy and completing the cut and just flipping it up in order to get back there. Hmm. So it looks like there's another question. What are the most common patient objections you hear when discussing NACI? You guys have any input? Well, it used for me, it used to be the fact that it was two procedures. But I have to be honest with you, I'm doing a diagnostic arthroscopy for, for any cartilage procedure, pretty much I'm doing. Even if I think it's from the outset, an osteochondrialograft, I want to get a good lay of the land no matter what cartilage repair I'm doing. So when, I'm, when that patient brings up, yeah, but Macy's two procedures, 
my response at this point is saying, well, well, to be honest with you, in my practice, every joint preservation approach is going to be two procedures. So, you know, that I, that, I'm, I'm, I can parry that objection pretty quickly. And then the last thing is just, you know, the, the length of time before we release them back to full activities. Dr. Cotton, what do you think? Yeah, so I think mine is the non-weight bearing period and kind of the length of time, maybe not to full activities, but uh, to the older crowd, the non-weight bearing. And I, I kind of explained to them that there's no meaningful chondral procedure that restores cartilage where that's not the case. So it's not like this one's any more involved necessarily than any other one that, that, that they could do. Yeah, I think for me, my the most common ejections I get are from overbearing parents in, in you know, 19, 18, 19, 20 year old patients that they're, you know, seven to nine months after surgery, their parents are telling them that they feel fine and they can get back to sports and you kind of have to talk them back down and, and keep them with a more, uh, you know, global perspective. Indication for use. May see. Autologous cultured chondrocytes on porcine collagen membrane is an autologous cellularized scaffold product that is indicated for the repair of single or multiple symptomatic full thickness cartilage defects of the adult knee with or without bone involvement. Macy is intended for autologous use and must only be administered to the patient for whom it was manufactured. The implantation of Macy is to be performed via an arthrotomy to the knee joint under sterile conditions. The amount of MACI administered is dependent upon the size, surface in centimetre squared, of the cartilage defect. The implantation membrane is trimmed by the treating surgeon to the size and shape of the defect to ensure the damaged area is completely covered and implanted cell side down. Limitations of use Effectiveness of MACI in joints other than the knee has not been established. Safety and effectiveness of Macy in patients over the age of 55 years have not been established. Important safety information. Macy is contraindicated in patients with a known history of hypersensitivity to gentamicin, other amino glycosides, or products of porcine or bovine origin. Macy is also contraindicated for patients with severe osteoarthritis of the knee, inflammatory arthritis, inflammatory joint disease, or uncorrected congenital blood coagulation disorders. Macy is also not indicated for use in patients who have undergone prior knee surgery in the past six months. Excluding surgery to procure a biopsy or a concomitant procedure to prepare the knee for a Macy implant. Macy is contraindicated in patients who are unable to follow a physician-prescribed post-surgical rehabilitation program. The safety of Macy in patients with malignancy in the area of cartilage biopsy or implant is unknown. Expansion of present malignant or dysplastic cells during the culturing process or implantation is possible. Patients undergoing procedures associated with Macy are not routinely tested for transmissible infectious diseases. A cartilage biopsy and Macy implant may carry the risk of transmitting infectious diseases to healthcare providers handling the tissue. Universal precautions should be employed when handling the biopsy samples and the Macy product. Final sterility test results are not available at the time of shipping. In the case of positive sterility results, healthcare provider or providers will be contacted. To create a favourable environment for healing, concomitant pathologies that include meniscal pathology, cruciate ligament instability and joint misalignment must be addressed prior to or concurrent with the implantation of Macy. Local treatment guidelines regarding the use of thromboprophylaxis and antibiotic prophylaxis around orthopaedic surgery should be followed. Use in patients with local inflammations or active infections in the bone, joint and surrounding soft tissue should be temporarily deferred until documented recovery. The Macy implant is not recommended during pregnancy. For implantations post-pregnancy, the safety of breastfeeding to infant has not been determined. Use of Macy in paediatric patients younger than 18 years of age or patients over 65 years of age has not been established. The most frequently occurring adverse reactions reported for Macy greater than 5% were arthralgia, tendonitis, back pain, joint swelling and joint effusion. Serious adverse reactions reported for Macy were arthralgia, cartilage injury, meniscus injury, 
treatment failure, and osteoarthritis. For more information or to view full prescribing information, please go to macy.com.